My name is Roberto Rivera, and I am 32 years old. Cool. What are you doing to uh, to solve today's problems, and how did you get to where you are today? Like, basically, what's your story? Well, I have a, a very long story, but uh, essentially, you know, I believe that young people are part of the solution. I think oftentimes they're framed as being part of the problem. Um, I think Einstein said it best when he said that we cannot solve the current problems we are facing with the same thinking we used when we created these problems. And I think the people that we are turning to to try to find the solutions to the problems that we're facing today for unemployment and for a school system that is fundamentally broken, um, you know, issues that are going on with incarceration, you know, we're not going to find the solution going to the same old people who we've been going to for generations because these are many of the people who created these problems. I think that if we want to come up with viable solutions, we need to start hearing from a different perspective, a different mindset. I think we need to hear from our youth. I think our youth are the key to bring in these creative solutions that we're all desperately looking for. However, I believe that youth, in order to come up with these solutions, to have a voice that is heard and respected, they need the support of their community. They need the support from their educators, the support from their politicians, from their religious leaders, from their parents, from youth workers, from local artists. And so what I'm doing is connecting with these different spheres of society and trying to help bring these folks together so that they can begin uh, supporting the positive development of youth and helping youth to find their voice, to use that voice to affect change. Um, as you can tell, I'm very passionate about this, not only because I have uh, you know, a lot of experience working with youth and doing research, but because I was one of those youth. I was one of those youth who thought that, you know, all this stuff is going on in the world and I can't do anything to change it, so I just want to escape from reality. You know, I just want to go party and, and, and smoke weed and, 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 and sell, and I'm going to be an outlaw. I'm going to be a thug, and that's the only way that I can affect change. That's the only way that I don't have to deal with the painful issues that are going on. And what I learned is I began to get more uh, engaged through hip hop is that hip hop is a culture, you know, that started 35 years ago by teenagers who found creative ways of confronting their realities and developing uh, knowledge and people power and using their voice to affect change. And so learning about that example helped me to realize that there were other ways that I could deal with some of the issues that I was facing, that I too could be part of the solution and not just be part of the problem. So I embarked on a lifelong journey of trying to be, you know, an advocate for youth, of, of trying to use my voice and help other people to do the same. And so that's inspired the work that we do with The Good Life, which is, you know, committed and getting our hands dirty locally, but also supporting and building capacity and local leaders nationally. So that's a little bit about what we do. What are some ways that you've had to work across kind of traditionally defined boundaries to get stuff done? Well, I think uh, it's important, you know, with the work that we do, and I speak at conferences around the nation, you know, it's important to frame and reframe you as them being part of the solution, like I said before. And I think once people realize that, you know, young people are in a stage of, of development and trying to figure out who they are and what's going on in the world around them, um, and that media is trying to really capitalize on this stage of development and trying to get young people to become consumers and trying to get their identity to be wrapped around certain brands, I've found a lot of success in saying, look, if we don't come together as a community to support the positive development of youth, then, you know, media, which is almost omnipresent, will begin to socialize and condition these young people to being all about chasing the American dream, all about this rugged individualism, consumerism. And if we want to start moving things in a positive direction, we have to put aside our differences start working together to empower our young people to be a part of the solution. And one of the examples of, of putting this into practice 
has been in the work that I've done in Los Angeles, specifically in the city called Wilmington, which is near Compton, which is near Long Beach, in the South Bay area of the city. And so we started working with a group of youth and just giving them time to reflect, starting to develop a critical media literacy, trying to help them to understand the power and the potential of using hip hop as a tool to affect change. And once these young people began to start waking up to who they are and what they were capable of doing, they started saying, hey, you know what? Just like those kids in the Bronx affected change in the early 70s, we can affect change in our community. So here is a community where nonprofits were, you know, kind of fighting with each other to try to get different grants. Um, there, it was very divisive. And in addition to that, you know, the gang life in Wilmington was very, very violent to the point where, you know, folks weren't coming together. You couldn't even go to a park because folks were so afraid of being in an open public space. They are afraid that their kids would get shot. And so these youth, they began to take the leadership role and saying, hey, we want to do an event to let people know that things don't have to always be this way. And so they came up with an idea of doing a hip hop revival. And they first got the buy-in from their parents, full backing and support from their parents, many of whom were from Mexico and Central America. And that was huge that their parents would support them in using hip hop as a tool for change. And so with that in place, these young people began connecting across different organizations, across different democratically elected officials, and getting the support from the entire community. And they ended up doing an event called the Hip Hop Revival in 2006. And it was a beautiful event. It was very powerful. And one of the things that we saw happening, Ben, is that some of the gang leaders started coming to this event with their children. Because as I had said before, you know, to go to a park with a kid was a very dangerous thing. You were putting yourself, you know, if there's a drive-by, you're putting yourself in a dangerous situation. But since they had the backing of the whole city, politicians, different nonprofits, this event was an extremely safe place, so much, in fact, that the gang leaders began to show up, bringing their kids. And here we are in a situation you know, during the day, there's face painting going on with the kids, puppet shows, there's barbecue. And an amazing thing happened where these gang leader kids started playing together, started getting faces painted together and playing different games and stuff. So seizing this opportunity, one of the local leaders there in L.A., Eli Fournier, he said, hey, man, this is an opportunity. What if we go talk to these gang leaders? And so we went over there and talked to them, and they were very happy to have an event like this to bring their kids to that was safe. And we just started asking them, you know, what do you want to, what do you want to, what do you think about doing more events like this in the future? And they said that it would be great. They said that they'd be willing to help. And they all identified the gang violence as being one of the critical issues. And they said, you know what, but if we could have more events like this, I'd be willing to do whatever I need to do to make sure that there's some sort of a peace treaty between the gang. So going to all the different gang leaders, they were telling us the same thing. So we took a risk, we brought all the gang leaders together, and we said, look, we know you guys never have any dialogue, but we want you to have a discussion today about what kind of community do you want your children to inherit in the future? Do you want them to inherit this violent, community that we've been experiencing for many years, or do you want to see more events like this? Do you want to see a community of peace? And based off of that is kind of the prompt. They embarked in this huge conversation about a community that could be positive and uplifting and supportive for the development of their children. At the end of that conversation, they said, we want to start working on a gang peace treaty, and we're gangbangers. We don't just talk about stuff. We like to be about it. So we want to go on that stage over there and tell everybody our intention. And so these gang leaders went up on stage, and by now this was going more to the hip-hop events of the night. So the teens uh, were having a hip-hop fashion show. They had an MC battle. They had different performers performing. They had a crump battle. And in the midst of all that, these gang leaders got up on the mic and they said, we don't need any introduction. Y'all know who we are. 
We are gang leaders, arch leaders up in here, and you will not find us in the same place without trying to kill each other. And by now, the police who were there for security have their hands on their guns. And the gang leader says, but we're not here for all that. We're here because of our children. And we want to see our children grow up and have an opportunity to do positive stuff too. So on behalf of our children, we want to start working on a gang peace treaty. And right there in front of everybody, they began to shake hands. And as they were shaking hands, Ben, I looked over at the police. Their jaws were on the floor. The parents who were there who were supporting the youth were crying. The youth who helped to organize this event were completely amazed that this thing that they had put together had created an atmosphere that was pregnant with so much possibility. And all the different organizations who witnessed that, they realized that here they were fighting and being so divisive it was time for them to come together, and the youth showed them that possibility could happen. And so the work is still going forward in Wilmington, California. Uh, they have hip-hop workshops. They have, uh, you know, they're using our Fulfill the Dream curriculum out there. And that's just one example on how youth can have a voice and start bringing people together and start impacting change. But it doesn't stop there. I mean, beyond the gang violence, you know, young people need to have a voice in discussing issues of unemployment. They need to have a voice in discussing issues of, of uh, inequality in the funding of schools. They need to have a voice in talking out about this notion of urban renewal, which is displacing uh, thousands of families across this nation through gentrification projects. And so I believe that these young people need to not only be heard, as we were discussing before, but need to be respected when they're heard. And so we're continuing in this spirit here in Chicago, um, helping our young people to become facilitators, teaching other youth, but also trying to get them to become critical researchers where they have data supporting the work that they're doing so we can show, hey, look, this is not just our opinion. We have a, a survey that we've administered with a thousand people and here are our findings on this piece. And so this is kind of bringing us up to date now. Great. That is, there's some truly inspiring stories in that, in that answer. I 